Hello, I'm Jackie Barry, author of the new book, Experiential Speaking, which is icebreakers and energizers for speakers and trainers. And I'm here today with Dr. Linda Shaw, who is a neuroscientist. And this is what it says on her uh, website as a cognitive neuroscientist with business psychology and an entrepreneurial background. Linda offers a deeper understanding of what it takes to thrive and prosper. And as a speaker as well, what she talks about in organizations is the science of embracing change, um, for which there is a huge demand. So Linda, welcome. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, Hello. <laughs> thank you for being here. And I guess as a speaker, uh, you do talks all around the country, around the world maybe, about uh, the science of embracing change. Do you do them as straight keynotes or do you use audience participation activities to help engage them? That's really a good question because I've, I do, I'm a keynote speaker, but an awful lot of people who book speakers don't quite understand what keynote means in the speaking world, which is fine. Why should they have to know? They just know what they need for their particular delegates and the particular conference that they're arranging. But what I've noticed is that more and more people are asking for e interaction, even though they are asking for a keynote speaker, which historically is no interaction. You stand up there and you deliver for 45 minutes or an hour, and then you get off the stage. It's not even a Q and A a lot of the time. But I've known more and more people are either wanting me to speak on the stage and have some kind of audience participation, and or have a very short, as we call it, keynote talk but then have a, a time as a panel so that the audience can ask, ask questions of the panelists and get exactly what they want from, from the experts that are on the stage, which serves the audience much better. So I think um, there is a, a definite shift in the speaking industry for far more interaction going on with the audience. And do you have favorite exercises that you use currently that you found to work well with your audiences? Well, yeah, I do actually, because I've noticed that sometimes um, speakers might use um, a, an activity that actually has no relevance to the message. And I find that, um, I actually find that irritating. Mm. Um, so, um, because people are there to be served, it's about the audience and it's about them learning stuff that is really valuable to them right now that they can use at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. That's yeah. the whole point of the people who are spending their time to sit there and listen to you. So I think we have to be really make sure we're very relevant. So because I'm a neuroscientist, what I tend to do is I use exercises that show people that they are actually more in control of their brain than they think they are. So I use things like, classically, you may have seen it, um, there's one where um, you get the audience to still sit, sit down normally, but make sure they can move their feet. And they lift one foot off the ground, their right foot off the ground, and they circle it in a clockwise motion, going round the clock, one, two, three, four, five, six, and keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Whilst they're doing that with their foot, they take their right hand in the air and then they draw a number six. Very simple, but it, what it shows them is like, whoa, what's going on? Because if you try it now, um, you find that you're not in control of your foot or you're not in control of your hand and you're doing all sort of wobbly things. And all it is, is I'm demonstrating that if you practice things, you can do them well. Because what I've asked is for the left hemisphere of your motor cortex to actually go in two opposite directions at the same time. And if you're not practiced at martial arts, or you're not a drummer, or something where you use your, each of your limbs in a different way, then um, it's new to you. Um, so that's a demonstration that actually, we it, it livens people up, it, it gives them a little bit of, um, of enthusiasm to start with and they go whoa what's wrong with me but actually in fact, there's nothing wrong with them it's just demonstrating a point about neuroscience and it's a simpler way of getting your message across absolutely absolutely yeah they really like it even, even the ones who are the most um unlikely really like it <laughs> <laughs> now that's interesting what's what do you think is the uh, why do people resist getting involved in um well, that's a silly question, I'll cut it. <laughs> Why do people resist getting involved in anything they think is gonna make them look foolish? <laughs> obviously well, that's the very that. thing. Yeah, I mean, there is, we really don't like to be embarrassed. 
Yeah. Um, and we don't like to look as if we are being silly or we like to be seen as very professional. So we don't want, you know, we are, even if we would be uh, perhaps um, do silly things outside of the business environment within business, people are going, but, oh, but I'm a CEO or I'm a senior lawyer or I am a whatever. And they're going, I, I don't do that. Um, but in actual fact, um, I think it shows a different dimension to that person if they're willing to participate and take part and show a different part of their personality, regardless of their seniority. So here's the proper question behind that then. As the speaker, how do you frame it? How do you set it up so these people feel comfortable and safe to engage in a physical activity like that? I think the only way you can really frame something in that it's not going to be embarrassing is to say so. To say, look, I, I hate being embarrassed myself. Anything I ask you to do is not going to be embarrassing and it's going to be completely within your capabilities. Absolutely no problem. Wouldn't dream of asking to do something you couldn't do. So I think you have to read the audience a little bit or the room a little bit. So if you have got a um, some very senior people who um, might not know each other very well, then they're going to be a little bit reticent they're going to be holding back a little bit so they need to, you need to explain that and that's the only way I approach it when I when I'm with senior people I think the other thing to think about is that we live in a multicultural society so we have to be mindful of of different upbringings and different environments that people have grown up in and um, that what sits with people and what doesn't so we we do have to be very respectful mm. of not embarrassing people so the top tip is to call it out. Yeah, I think so. Is that how you say it? I, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's an American phrase. I don't know where I picked it up on, but it's, it's basically the, uh, yeah, mentioning the elephant in the room. It's saying uh, you're going to be asked to do stuff, but don't worry, it's not going to be embarrassing and silly. Um, and I suppose as the speaker, <clears throat> excuse me, I suppose as the speaker, the, you give permission by doing the silliest and most embarrassing things yourself. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really good idea as a speaker to demonstrate. Um, in fact, in your book, which I happen to have a copy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, in, in your book, uh, you, you, st you say that at one point, I think there is questions in a hat. And you, 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 you particularly as the speaker, you take out the first question. So you're demonstrating not, not just that you're not at all embarrassed to answer a question that you don't know what's going to be in the hat, but you're also showing how long the answer is roughly, what is expected. So people can see by the demonstration what is expecting of them. And they're not going to go off on a tangent talking too much or talking too little or answering inappropriate, anything. Just, it just helps them put, put them at ease really when they see a demonstration from the speaker and one of the things I do on the copywriting for recruitment course that I co-deliver um, is give out cheese if they write something cheesy and give out smarties if they write something smart and I always make sure to award cheese to myself whenever I say anything cheesy so that I end up with more mini baby bells in front of me than anyone else does and that that takes away the sting for people lovely lovely <laughs> excellent I like that that's really good um, so you, like me, have no doubt been in many audiences yourself and you already indicated that the worst possible thing you ever see a speaker do is ask an audience to do something that's irrelevant to their point. And audiences are generally polite. They will go along with ordinarily what you ask them to do, even if they're hating it. Um, what activities have you participated in as an audience member that really stuck with you as memorable in a good way and maybe some that didn't work at all i think um i i think uh, what the ones that stay with me are the ones that reinforce learning um uh, again there is a point may, if, if you don't if i'm, not, I'm being a bit cheeky here I've, can may i refer to your book jackie <laughs> of course <yes. laughs> there is something in here that i really like and that resonates with me and is it you say on page 75 that um, for, um, that once again this exercise can be adapted according to your needs perfect um, for example it can be used as a revision exercise excellent in, or in, instead of asking people to share fascinating facts they can share key points they've learned so far or any questions they may have that's really sensible 
that is really sensible. So they're writing it down. I think, what are they writing it down? That might even be your toilet paper chapter. Oh, you can do it on a piece of toilet paper. So they don't write it down. They just have to have one message, whatever question you set, per sheet of toilet paper they've torn off. But they tear it off without knowing why they're doing that. Yeah, no, I think that really sticks. And that's the sort of thing that stays with me when I'm in the audience, is that I'm now writing a question I may have, or what I've learned from it. Um, and that is, and if, and if you then share that with a group, or indeed with the room, if it's a small group of people, then that's going to help everybody else learn at the same time and reinforce learnings for everybody. So, and that, that's the sort of thing, because it's on toilet roll and the sheet of toilet tissue, then it's a sort of a, oh, for goodness sake, but it's not, too embarrassing it's just you're writing on a piece of paper basically um but it's it's incredibly memorable i think i thought that was a really good tip i'm glad you like whiteman thank you um so you know that i use these activities because my background is a copywriter my my day job my whole career has been about how to communicate a message clearly whether it's on paper on screen or face to face and i know through my psychology degree that uh how to use words to influence behavior or, or how to, uh, yes, communicate clearly. And so I know that activities help people remember key points when they're relevant and when they're uh, run properly. And you as a neuroscientist, have you got any insight into what's actually happening in the audience brain that's different when they're doing something compared with when they're just sitting and passively listening to your words of wisdom from the stage? Well, first of all, when the topic of memory and the brain is hugely complex, okay, it really, really is. So to get involved in that, I could, I could sit here and talk to you for two hours about the memory and the brain, which would be fantastically interesting and fascinating. However, that's not the reason that you're all sitting here listening to this. So what are, the message for me to give to you now is that, um, that there are a variety of mechanisms the brain uses all the time when it lays down memories, okay? And the first thing you've ever got to do, almost all of the time, ever got to do, almost as a contradiction, but the first thing you've, that, to do, or that we have to do is get somebody's attention. We do lay down memories with unconscious um, stimuli going on, but that's not what we that's not what we're in the business of we're in the business of getting people's attention so that then those mechanisms in the brain can actually start to consolidate memories that have got something to do with the knowledge they have so far so first of all you've got to get their attention by doing something like an activity so they're awake and they're really focused now they're going what they're going to do next or what's he going to do next that's really really good but we really need to make sure that we can consolidate that with either something physical or something with emotion or something where it, it becomes even more memorable Okay, I've just been to CERN, and if you go and understand anything about um, physics, which I know very little, but you go there and you're absolutely fascinated, but it's very hard to learn, because unless you have physics in your background, it's hard to actually make sense of this new information. So it's harder, it's much harder work. So when we are talking to our audience, we need to make sure, A, we've got their attention, and B, we're also giving knowledge that they can relate to so they can join up the dots more easily and it's more readily memorable. That's about the best way I can think of explaining how memory um, works with the brain as when you're doing any kind of talk and giving information because it's those variety of mechanisms that you need to engage. Oh, thank you. That's, that's brilliant because it reinforces my belief that interaction in the way that clients are now demanding it increasingly um, it actually works. It does work. It does work. Remember, you've got to get people's attention because you can't rely on subliminal learning. Um, and um, so, um, therefore, you, you know, if, if, if any kind of exercise, anything you do will get people's attention and get them going. And they will get some kind of emotional connection and then they will get some kind of joining up the dots with the knowledge they have so far. Um, so therefore they're more likely to anchor that memory um, in their own remit, in their own, in their own um, perception of what's going on. And therefore your, your message will stick. 
Well, you're clearly brilliant at knowing what's going on cognitively for people in all kinds of environments. So if anyone wants to find out more, where can they go to look you up online? Well, I'm Linda with a Y. It makes it really hard to give my email address over the phone, over, over any, any kind of visual like this, but it's linda at drlindashaw.com is my website. Or, um, uh, yeah, Linda, L-Y-N-D-A-S-H-A-W, and that's D-R for the doctor. So All linda right, at that was a caption. Put it down here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> here we go. Linda at drlindashaw.com. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. You're welcome, Jackie. Lovely talking to you.